Father, we just come before your presence. We thank you for another day, O oh God, in which your grace is still working in our lives. We ask you as we begin to see your word, that we begin to have understanding of what you're saying to us. And that, Lord, this day that you'll begin to open up our hearts to know that you knew us before the world was even formed and created, because you're God. And that, Lord, before we were ever conceived of or even thought of, Lord, you had already, oh God, mapped out our steps in life, in this life. Father God, we exalt you, we cling to you this day. We ask for you, oh God, to cause forth your spirit, to press us and shape us and mold us into the character and the nature of the Lamb of God. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we left off on our last meeting in the 8th chapter of Romans. Believe it or not, I'm going to try to get through the chapter 10 today. This is the uh, fourth week of Bible school. Oh, I did not. <laughs> thank you, Karen. I don't forget any suffering. Praise God. Thank the Lord of eyes. And this is the fourth week of Bible school, and there's only two weeks left, and after that we'll break for the summer, and um, then after these sessions we'll start again in probably uh, late August or early September. So we'll spend that time reading different books and going back over the tapes and on this word being ingrained in us. Amen? But let's pick up that last part of Romans 8 again. I just love thinking about this. I think we're learning this, especially those of us who have been studying about the fires we come through. I want to begin again at Romans 8, verse 33. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes. Rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for thy sake we are being put to death all day long. We're carried as sheep to be slaughtered, but in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul literally speaks to us about the normalcy of the Christian walk, what's normal, the tribulations, the trials, the strikes, the persecutions, the perils. We're being put to death. Thank God we're all being put to death. Amen? Amen. It's only as we are put to death that Jesus Christ lives in us. Thank God we have been coming to sheep to be slaughtered all day long. But after telling us about the normalcy of the Christian walk, he now cha totally changes thoughts. He begins to address something. And this thing that he's about to address has to do with why God made certain statements, especially in the Old Testament, for example, concerning Esau. And many times people say, well, why did God hate Esau before he was ever born? But God hated him because God knew the, the, the choice of his will and what he would choose to do against the will of God. And God will do everything he can to turn a man, but God knows. Just like Jesus knew before when he chose Judas and he was choosing the man that was going to betray him. You remember when he would say on different times, he would give little hints, little suggestions. He would say, did I not choose 12 of you? And yet one of you is a devil. Jesus knew all the time. It's a mystery to us as human beings to know, why did God do such a thing? For example, have you ever wondered why God ever formed Adam and Eve, knowing all the time what would happen to Adam and Eve? Knowing all the time that his son Jesus would come and die for us? This is even before he even formed the world and created the world? Well, the Bible doesn't tell us why. But God knew all these things. God knew you before you were born. God knew me before I was born. Everything you're going through has been ordained of God. Your names were even ordained of God. You didn't just name your children because you thought of some nice name. I'm sure you probably went to some library and found the books, you know, and said, oh, this sounds cute. Oh, I like this one. Oh, oh this is a real good name. God was in all of it. God knew exactly what he was doing. He knew us. He called us by name before we were even placed in our mother's womb. And so after Paul telling us the normalcy of what we're to expect as being believers, the tribulations, the trials, the struggles, the hardship, the places of difficulty, and all the fires we're going through, 
And of course, you know, continuously as we are being perfected, we will always be inspected by different ones in the body. They're saying, well, I don't like her because of this, or I don't like her because of this. And there's always these little charges to come. God is saying, who brings a charge against God's elect? While all these things are taking place, Jesus is standing there at the right hand of God. He's continually just making an intercession for us to the Father, just praying for us to the Father. Isn't that that's something good to think about? And so, now Paul says in verse chapter 9, Romans chapter 9, I am telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bear me witness in the Holy Spirit. Paul is about to reveal something that is burning in him. It is a zeal. He says, I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. You know what's beginning to happen to me? I was, I got a report this morning, you know, there's a brother and I in the church, we wake each other up at 4 o'clock every morning, if one of us over sleep, we just sort of check in with one another, and uh, he was telling me about some of the things that's been said now by the different prosperity preachers and teachers, and I remember when I first came out of some of these illusions, I came out in anger, because I was just so stunned that such a delusion could wrap my heart when I knew that I began to walk with the Lord, and had nothing but the Word of God to lead me and to direct me and to guide me. And I came out just in anger, thinking, how could this happen? Look what's happened to all these poor sheep. Well, you know, this message now, we know that God has said to us that he would do a quick work in righteousness and then cut it short. And of course, the New American Standard explains to us exactly and precisely how God uh, had chosen to do that work. He said, the Lord will execute his word thoroughly and quickly upon the earth. So it's becoming normal now that people begin to come back to the word of God to find out what the word says. And I'm beginning to see something take place among those that preach delusions. There is not a softening of the heart. There is more now a, you might say, a, a more hardening of the heart. And the statement has, is not being made, well, I don't know why anybody can speak against prosperity. I'm going to laugh all the way to the bank. Now, you know, it's, it's amazing how when you look at light and you just look at light, the moment darkness comes, you recognize it. And I think about the people that laughing giggle as these statements are being made. And I said to myself, I guarantee you that if they had been exposed to the word of God, or maybe had heard such a statement made when they first began to walk with Christ, because it was so illuminated with light, they would have said, what haughtiness, what arrogance, what pride. But that's what happened. That's a testimony of Esau in the book of Malachi. The Lord says, I'm going to, in fact, let me show it to you. Go there with my shirt and show it to you. Our first coordinate you're reading. God says, I'm going to tear you down. And then Esau says, I'm going to reveal. God says, you may reveal, but I'll tear you down. And God talks about that there shall be known um, as a place of desolation and one of people that God is indignant against forever. Let me show you this. And so as I thought about that this, this morning, I said to myself, my God, can you see the day when those of us that are truly redeemed of the Lamb standing before the Lord in glory, purified, reflecting his jewels and his loveliness. I almost talked about this last night, but if you've been in Bible school, you've been through the book of Revelation. You know now that the jewels of Revelation is what we are going to become. It's talking about us, the beauty of us, the beauty of holiness. That's what all those Jews represent. And I said to myself, and they, we stand there, and our accusers come up, and yet in this world, they looked like they were so successful and they had everything going for them. They reflected everything the flesh desires and what man calls success. And I just had an overwhelming grief this when I thought, my God, what a tragedy. How horrible it is to be deceived. We get how easy. And I began to recognize the Lord said, if it was possible, even the very elect would be deceived. For the most part, a lot of us, most of us were deceived, but God protected us and brought us out because he saw that thing burning in our hearts. We just wanted to know him. And we got in these byways and these broadways trying to follow him. And we had heard of the men's reputation and how much they knew God, and so we began to join ourselves to them, never re realizing that only the Lord would reveal to us the narrow way as we begin to cling to him and look to him. But let me show you the attitude of Esau. Malachi 1, the order of the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. 
I have loved you, says the Lord. But you say, how has thy love us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob. But I have hated Esau. I have made his mountains a desolation, which means his kingdoms. Remember, the Titan shadows again, mountains. It means all of his kingdoms. Each of us have our own little kingdom. The things in your house is your kingdom. Things you go out and buy, you buy to bring into your kingdom. Things you possess. It means everything that has to do with your life, that which you, which you are ruler over, or that you have the power over. Amen? Mountains, a desolation. And, and appointed his inheritance for the jackals of the wilderness, which means the demon spirits, the jackals of the wilderness. Now I want you to notice the attitude of Esau. You see, we're all suffering in this day, the final day, when he is sitting as a purifier of silver and of gold. The Lord God is among us. I want to make sure that we know that. He is here. And I can understand now Anna's sister's visions when she said, the time would come it would become so difficult for the believer in the earth. She said, but I looked and I saw the Lord God among them and they never realized it or even knew it. And all of a sudden, he spoke a word, she said, I mean, I'm just bringing it to them the vision, if you remember it, and the darkness would begin to fade away like a vapor, and all of a sudden they said, Jesus, you've been among us. I'm telling you, he's here. He's among us. He's finishing up what he's begun in us. He's among us. He's walking with us more now than he ever has. I would make it even stronger if I wouldn't be accused of being a heretic or committing blasphemy, but I'm convinced he's off the throne and he's in the earth among us, polishing us and finishing us up. He's begun in us. And so they're suffering also. They're feeling the effects of it, but they're holding on to the lie. Just like he said in the prophet Isaiah, can you not say this is a lie in my right hand and throw it down? He's not able to. And I want you to notice what it says. When this, this, this intensity is taking place, notice what comes out of Esau's heart. There is no sign of repentance there. They've gone too far to say we are wrong or have been wrong. Verse 4, though Edom says, we have been beaten down, but we will return and build up the ruins. That's the attitude. I'm going to laugh all the way to the bank they say today. It's becoming now a fad, you know, word. Like we had when we was in school, we called it job talking. You know, and little terms and slang terms we had. Now that's becoming, we're going to laugh over to the bank. God says they may build, but I will tear down, and men will call them the wicked territory. Now the word men is not there. What it literally says is, they may build, and, but I will tear down, and will call them the wicked territory and the people toward whom the Lord is indignant forever. And notice what he says in the fifth verse. And your eyes will see this. Is that in your Bible? And you will say, the Lord be magnified beyond the borders of Israel. Well, this is what we're about to look at this morning in the ninth chapter, in the tenth chapter of Romans. I don't know how far we'll get. We don't ever seem to get as far as we planned, but that's all right, too. And let's go back to Romans 9. And I mean, I had an old woman grief this morning. I thought about all the sheep that are under all these shepherds all over this country, and we stand before him as a people in this life. Because we're joined to him, we also can say, Lord, we also have been men that's acquainted with grief and sorrows. Because he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. We bear in our bodies also the sufferings of Christ. To be rejected is an honor. It's an honor to honor him. Amen? But I thought about those who thought they were in light. And that, yea, they called light darkness and darkness light. And that's what we're reading. This is Paul's attitude in writing the ninth chapter. You must remember what we're coming, we're being transformed from, or transported out of. We were first in his whole thought, he gave us an introduction in the first eight chapters of what the walk, the narrow way, was really all about. He first began with a rebuke, a comparison, a horrible comparison, 
of those that were going back to the law, he compared it to being as the same as going back to something which was perverse as, as the sin of homosexuality. Remember that, amen? Then he comes out of that and begins to reestablish what it means to follow Christ. He tells us about faith. He tells us all the work of God's grace. He tells us that we can't earn it. He tells us about our father Abraham, the man of covenant. Well, I'm, we know about he had a covenant with Noah also. But I'm talking about a covenant of redemption, one of salvation, one where blood was shed. That began to point to us the ultimate covenant that God was, was to make with all mankind. He said, what did our father Abraham, according to the faith, has found? And if Abraham earned it, the Bible goes on to say through Paul, then he would have something to boast about, but not before God. And so we begin to discover our walk with God and his work in us is done by our faith in him, to look to him, to believe him and to trust him that he will so surely complete that which he has begun in us because he is faithful to do what he's promised to do. Amen? Seventhly, God is bringing me all the way through. God is bringing me all the way through. All the way to the other, other side. All the way to the other side. A completed and finished product. A completed and finished product. By his hands. By his hands. See, we're his handiwork. We're his workmanship. He's doing it all in us. Before we were born, he knew all of our weaknesses, what our weaknesses would be. He knew our flaws. He knew how many times we'd fall away and come back and backslide and come back and call him his name and be frustrated. He knew every time. He knew every second we'd walk under condemnation and grief. But he also saw something in us, a desire to be righteous, a desire to be holy, a desire to be sanctified. And then God did something in us. He brought us to the place where he made us see that we were totally and absolutely and utterly helpless in ourselves. And though no, no amount of Bible knowledge would set us free, you know, knowing the word of God is important, but that we, have, we would be brought to a place where we would begin to fulfill what he said would happen in the earth, Isaiah 4 and Ezekiel 9, that we would become a people that continue to cry out to him. You know, I'm convinced and we'll reach a place where we'll say, Jesus, come get us. We don't want this world any longer. I'm convinced of it. I am utterly convinced of it. And I want you to hear say, my bride is calling. Yes. I hear the voice of my beloved. Hallelujah. So Paul begins, after teaching us in the, eight, the first eight chapters, a wonderful lesson. He ended it so, so perfectly you have nothing to be condemned about in your weaknesses and your inabilities as long as you're clinging to him and you're in Christ Jesus the father is faithful to finish what he has done and there's nothing you've gone through and nothing that you've messed up in that's caused God's love to be altered one bit towards you that's why I want to begin this morning. Remind us, as we begin to see, Paul now begin to give us a, a lesson to know what it means to just be religious and to allow ourselves, because of pride of knowledge, to come to a place of self-righteousness, to where if God himself came down, he could not be heard. And that's what happened. And so Paul says in my chapter, I'm telling the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience is bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit, for I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ, for the sake of my brother, which, which are the Jews, of course, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom belong the adoption as sons, and the glory. You know, it's a sad thing to suffer and not have any glory. And how these people have suffered, can you say amen to that? But there's no glory of God resting on them. We saw it yesterday, first Peter 4. We always say we want the glory, but if there's no suffering, there is no glory. So we see something here. He says, the glory belonged to them, the adoption belonged to them as sons. The covenants, the giving of the law, the temple service, and the promises, 
whose are the fathers? From whom is the Christ according to the flesh who is over all God bless forever. Amen. Now you start to think about what he just said to us. There it was. God had chosen a race of people who once were not a people, like just like we were not a people. We're, we're now all in Christ of the God race. Of the seed. I didn't say we're becoming gods. Do not misinterpret what I said. Only God is God. Amen? Amen. In other words, we sort of have his divine nature. And when we truly walk in his divine nature, we won't be complaining about lust and things like this. Because his divine nature causes us to escape all the corruptions in this world by lust. It tells us very clearly. Why? Because of his excellent and magnificent promises. And so he says here, I want to tell you about a people, he says, who were selected, handpicked by God. They received a covenant of circumcision. He said, they were given adoption. Everything originated to bring about God's glory in the earth to this one selected group of people. And then Paul begins to speak about the tragedy. And he says in verse 6, but it is not as though the word of God has failed. Folks, is that in your Bible? And now he gives us a revelation. It is this revelation out of all of Paul's revelations that caused him to be hated, rejected, and despised. And it is still this revelation that will cause you and me to be hated above all and be rejected and hated and despised. Let me put you this way. God calls the body of Christ his true Israel. Now, let me prove it to you. You want proof? We've said it before, but in the, in the learning of God that's here today, I think we'll see it and understand it a lot better, okay? Let's go to Galatians for a moment. Let me show you. The fourth chapter. Now, remember, when he began to tell us this, do you remember what Paul said? He said these words, tell me if I'm right. He said, I'm telling the truth. Is that right? I lie not. My conscience bear me witness in the Holy Ghost. Is that right? Do you know when he began to talk about this revelation again to the church at Galatia, he began almost with the same salutation? And he said to them, have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? If I go to the fourth chapter, I'll show you this. Galatians 4. Paul says in verse 16, Have I therefore become, become your enemy by telling you the truth? They eagerly seek you. And who was seeking them? The Jews were seeking them to convert them back over to Judaism. Not commendably, but they wish to shut you out in order that you may seek them. But it is good always to be eagerly sought in a commendable manner. And not only when I am present with you, my children, with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you. But I could wish to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. Tell me, he says, you who want to be under the law, do you, do you not listen to the law? Remember we learned before about the, the double R's. Remember the, the do R's and for about the law? Anybody remember? The law is eternal, and it is even at this very second crying out, the righteous requirement, remember? And it's to love God with every fiber of our being. Remember we talked about that? Everybody say, righteous requirements. Righteous requirements. The law says continually to God. Judgment with no mercy. Judgment with no mercy. Judgment with no mercy. Remember when we went to that session? Y'all remember? Okay, good. This is the same group, right? <laughs> And then Jesus says, but Father, I'm the mercy seat. I'm the mercy. 
And so God made a covenant because of his blood, he said, their sins and iniquities, I will remember no more. And I'll be merciful, he said, to their iniquities. Remember that? So you might say that judgment and mercy kissed and the peace of God was given and extended. And so here these people are. They have been given the revelation that the walk with God is by faith. And that the words of the prophets are fulfilled. The just shall walk by faith. Not the law. Not rituals. By faith. And so Paul wants to know if he's their enemy because he's going to tell them again. He says in verse 21, tell me, you who want to be under the law, or under law, do you not listen to, to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the bondwoman and one by the free woman. Let me help you. Paul reminds them of the word of God. But do you know what he's telling them really? God has two sons in the earth. Remember, Abraham really reflects to us as believers, God the Father. And he says in verse 23, But the son by the bondwoman was born according to the flesh. Now, again, I remind you of this. We know that um, Ishmael was born according to the flesh, don't we? We also know that we were born according to the flesh. We also know that Isaac was born according to the flesh, but listen to me. But Isaac was born through faith. We have lots of people that answer altar calls. I watch it every week. I watch it on television every week. And I realize I'm looking there when I see those masses go forward. That's why I don't call people forward. Because we're not putting on a show. Most ministers use altar calls to prove that God's with them for the sake of the people out there. I don't need that. But there are two types of births taking place when there is an altar call given. There are those that's born according to the flesh, which means they come into God's kingdom with their expectation and what they want God to do for them. And then there are some born according to the Spirit and are saying, Lord, I want to know you. And I'll do whatever it takes to follow you. And that's what God talks about. And that's what Paul is really writing about. Let's read it and see if that's not what he's talking about. Now folks, first of all, I want to remind you of something. God uses us like pieces on a checkerboard. Or you might say the pieces in a chess game. Every last one of us. We are exactly as Paul wrote about it. Yes, we're his sons, praise his name. Thank you for his mercy. But we are the scum of the earth. We are. But it doesn't matter if you're the scum of someone you love. You can put through anything when you love, you know that. And I want you to watch how he tells us about human lives. And then he talks about these human lives as if God is writing a piece of poetry. It lets us know how nothing we really are. That's what he says. For it is written, verse 22, that Abraham had two sons. One by the one woman, which means was born according to the power of the flesh. And that's what these people are doing. They, go, they get this teaching about, here's nine ways to move God. Sixteen steps to prosperity. Four steps to have every prayer answered. Steps and rules and forms and shortcuts is always for those born of the bond woman. Of the flesh. And we'll get it done by the power of the flesh. What we're doing we're going to earn it. And then we'll get up and testify about why we were able to move heaven. Here's how you do it. Let me tell you people something. You cannot. It is impossible to put God in a box. You cannot. God is forever changing. You know why he's always changing? Because he only deals with those who continue to listen to him to be instructed. He might tell you one day, uh, 
spit on that person, and they'll be healed. You know what our people would do this morning in the flesh? Whistle on a doctrine of spitting. Born in the flesh. So he says. He said, don't you listen to the law? Two sons. Both called sons. One by the bondwoman, one by the free woman. That's what Paul's going to write to us about in Romans 9. But the son by the bondwoman was born according to flesh, and the son by the free woman was through the promise. And promises of God comes to pass when you put your faith in his promises. And faith comes not by you growing it. You can have faith like a grain of a mustard seed and mountains will be moved. Faith comes by listening to the word of God continuously. If you're fighting something in your life, a word to the wise, you find the word, the word of God says about it, you cut everything else out and listen only to that until you have the victory, what you're fighting through. And now, after telling us that, he now just begins to talk about like the little just pieces of dirt. That's what they are, we all are. Thank God we're his dirt. He says, this is allegorically speaking. For these, he says, women are two covenants. Is that in your Bible? Amen. One proceeding from Mount Sinai, bearing children. I want you to notice something. This life, of the sons of the flesh is continually being reproduced, bearing children. Who ought to be slaves, which means slaves of sin. She is Hagar. Now this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. Is that a desert place? And corresponds. Don't miss his words. He's not biting his tongue. He comes up and says it. Can you imagine him saying it right in their faces? Can you imagine the insults this man endured? The blasphemies? The hatred? The rejections? The condemnations? See, we read this, and now we have understanding of it, but Paul is doing it. Here from the Spirit of God, God's directing every step of the way. He says, this Hagar now corresponds to the present Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the place. He tells them it's a desert place. Y'all know, and we all know that Jerusalem is not in Arabia. Can you say amen to that? But he's telling them how God now sees Jerusalem. In other words, he's saying to them, the prophecy that Jesus spoke came to pass, and it's still in effect. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem was stone the prophets. How often I want to gather you the way I hand gathered her chicks under her wings. You didn't recognize me in the day of visitation, he said. And so now your house is being left to you desolate. That's what Paul just got through saying. The desert place is a place that is desolate. Can you say, man? No water's there. And then he now gives us another revelation that he writes about later on in Hebrews 12. He talks about the Jerusalem above and tells us something about our mother. We are born of the Holy Spirit. Our mother is the Holy Spirit. The name Jerusalem means city of peace. He said to us very clearly, the Jerusalem that we come out of as spiritual babes is one that is full of water full of the spirit that's why he says and all through the word of God Peter says it we're not in this world we're born from above 
And we wonder what it meant in Revelation. I saw the New Jerusalem coming down, it said. And then the one sitting on the throne said, He that sits on the throne declares, I am making all things new. It's a process. That life is continually coming down upon us. Then he says, verse 26, But the Jerusalem above is free. She, not going to be, is our mother. Then he says, For it is written, Rejoice, barren woman who does not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor, for more of the children of the desolate than of the one who has a husband. In other words, more will be born of the flesh than are born of the spirit. Our husband, the Bible says, is our maker. And you, brethren, like Isaac, are children of the promise. And then he tells them something about this spiritual birth that's called flesh. One spiritual birth is called flesh. One spiritual birth is called spirit. And they're both spiritual. He says in verse 29 in your Bible, but as at that time, he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so it is now also. But what does the Scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of a bondwoman, but of the what? Free woman. Is a free woman our mother above Jerusalem? And then he identifies Israel in the sixth chapter of Galatians. And remember, the sign of every Jew is circumcision. So you might put it in a most simplified way of saying a Jew is one that has is one that's been circumcised. The Lord says to us in Romans 2, 28 and 29. But he that is a Jew since Christ has come is no longer one of the flesh. Right? He says, but he that's a Jew, what does he say? It's not one out of the flesh, inwardly in the heart. Circumcision is no more of the flesh, but of the spirit. Is that right? That's why it says over Jesus' cross, this is Jesus, king of the Jews. That means he is king over all of those who are born of the spirit, Circumcised in the heart by the Spirit, but the love of flesh has been cut away from their heart by the Spirit. Jesus is only King of the Jews. The name Gentile no longer meant from when Jesus came those that were not physical Jews. It became a term to simply mean those who don't walk in covenant with God. That is one of the major foundations of Paul's writings and Revelation. Look what he says in the sixth chapter of Revelation. He says, <laughs> those, verse 12, who desire to make a good showing in the flesh, try to compel you to be circumcised, which means come back under the law, simply that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For those who are circumcised, that means those who are physical Jews, do not even keep the law themselves, but they desire to have you circumcised, that they may boast in your flesh. I find the same thing today happening with water baptism. Paul says in verse 14, but may it never be. And I don't care if he's baptized in Jesus' name. I don't care if he's baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Thank God you're baptized. I'm not going to get this doctrine of baptism laying on my hands and foot washing. But I'm going to go on a moment or two of things. All I can say to you is work with the body of Christ. That's what I'm going to say. I'm not going to come out and say something. You're not saved because you're baptized in Jesus' name. Or you're not saved because you're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen? Amen. So Paul says here. Verse 14, may it never be that I should boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, which means I'm only boasting about what Jesus has done. Through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. And now he goes back to this thing about circumcision and the Jew. He says, for neither is circumcision anything, nor uncircumcision, but what? A new creation or a new creature. 
Now he's going to say something to us about those of us that's born spiritually, a new creature. And those who will walk by this rule, what rule? The rule of the new creature. And he's going to tell you now who Israel is. He says, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Did you know this was prophesied in Psalm 73, verse 1? Did y'all know that? Is my microphone on out there? <laughs> Why don't we go to Psalm 73 and look what it says, says in verse 1? And so we have the church today bringing all the Israeli dancers that keeps the delusions alive. Y'all have Psalm 73? Amen. What it says in verse 1, Surely God is good to who? Israel. Israel. Now let the word of God define for you what God calls Israel. What does the rest of that verse say? Read it to me. Is that plain? Does that mean you've been circumcised in heart? So now you know who is what God calls Israel today. Amen? There is a fleshly Israel. There is a spiritual Israel. There's a fleshly Jew, there's a spiritual Jew. And for the spiritual Jew, fleshly Jew to be saved, he must become a spiritual Jew. And the cute little religious term that we have, you know, this is a completed Jew, sounds good. We're all completed Jews in Christ. Amen? Let's go back to Romans now. So, Oh, wait a minute. Before you do, go to Hebrews 12. I want to make sure we bring it all in in the beginning and show you how Paul writes consistently, consistently, the same revelation. Hebrews 12. And he begins in Hebrews 12, again fighting against this delusion of you've got to keep the law. And he says in verse 18, For you have not come to a mountain that may be touched into a blazing fire, and to darkness, and to gloom, and whirlwind. Have we come to Christ, folks? Yes. Now, notice he says to us here, in a very graphic manner, you're not back under the law. Because remember, all this was going on, God gave them the law. Is that right? Church? Yes. Amen. Is everybody awake today? He said, you didn't come to a blast of a trumpet and the sound of words which sound was such that those who heard begged that no further words should be spoken to them. For they could not bear the command if even a beast touched the mountain to beat the stone. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I'm full of fear and trembling. And what do we come to? And he tells us. And this is incredible what he says. In verse 22 through verse 24 is describing what God calls salvation. And what have we come to? But you have come to Mount Zion. Now you what it means. It says, in the last days, they will say, come, let's go back up to the mountain of the Lord, which means we're going right back to do it God's way. In other words, we are like the prodigal son who's been eating the doctrines, the husk of the pigs that tell us to go get the world. It's okay. Wallet in the mire. God doesn't mind. You can't lose it. Go back and eat your vomit again. God's not going to stop you. He loves you the same. Oh. I said, I know we have to go through the first time of this. I watched it. got some water there. Hallelujah. So Paul tells us something. And folks, let me say something to you. You must begin to see all things this way while you're in this natural life. Begin to talk this way while you're in this natural life. That's the language of every overcomer. I'm out of this world. I'm an overcomer. Amen. I've come to Mount Zion, the heaven of Jerusalem. As you come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heaven of Jerusalem, you come to myriads of angels. The angels of God only encamp around those that love him. You don't go around talking to angels. It's heresy. You come to the General Assembly and Church of the Firstborn. Oh, 
church of the which born? Firstborn. Who are enrolled in heaven. You've come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect. You've come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. And his blood is speaking to each and every one of us right now, isn't it? Amen. Let's go to Romans 9. So can you understand now why Paul has such grief? These people all know their history better than you know yours. Most of us don't know our roots. Every Jew knows his roots. And all those begots, begots, begot, begot, begots, begot, begot, begots was done because God was showing that exactly what he promised would come to pass, exactly as he said it. Most Jews know their lineage. We should know I was also spiritually. Amen. Amen. And so Paul knows that they know verse 4. Every Jew knows verse 4, Romans 9, 4. Here's, here, here's a problem they had. This was, what was that curse? Verse 4. He said, there are Israelites. To whom belong the adoption of sons. Every Jew knew that. And the glory and the covenants. Every Jew knew that. The giving of the law. Every Jew knew that. And the temple service and the promises. Every Jew knew that. And Paul knew because of their knowledge. That they had rejected Christ Jesus. Because of their history. But it's amazing to me that every Jew did not seem to understand that God meant exactly what he said, that if they reject his law, that he would curse them and scatter them. And so, this is what Paul says. Oh, like he did. This is what he said. Just pick up where we left off. <laughs> he says in verse 6, but it is not as though the word of God has failed, no, they failed like we failed God too. And now he says something to us. For they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Isn't that interesting? Is that interesting or not? <laughs> Neither are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants. Another shocking revelation. Put yourself in their shoes. They're hearing this man say this. And this man is a Jew. He has a revelation that was given to him from Christ himself. And he's telling it. And I want you to know they mocked him. They did everything they could to kill him. Because the same spirit that was in the earth in them when Jesus walked the earth was that same spirit operating against Paul. And it's the same spirit operating against every overcomer today in the land. Neither are they all children because we're able to have descendants, but through Isaac your descendants shall be named. In other words, through, through God's promises, Isaac was a child of promise. Ishmael was never promised. Ishmael was obtained through the working of flesh, the lusting of flesh, the desire of the flesh, the will of the flesh, and the strength and the might of the flesh. But you see, the things of God has nothing in common with the working of the flesh. Not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. I hear one man that I really respect his teaching. I won't call his name. I really love his teaching. When he, when he, he got into, and we get to write about demons, about belching and coughing and just breathing them out, I said to myself, you can't do nothing in the power of the flesh. Demons don't leave because you took a deep breath or belched. Demons leave because the anointing of the Lord, the anointing breaks the yoke. It's not by power. It's not by mind. But it's by my spirit, says the Lord. You put to death that these are flesh by the spirit, says the word of God. Amen? Amen. What he says. Well, Lord, Lord, we're so dumb. Can't you tell Paul to tell us what you mean? Yeah, he tells us right here. He says... That is, it is not 
the children of the flesh, who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. But this is the word of promise at this time, I shall come and Sarah shall have a son. And now he tells us something else. He comes into verse 10. And you'd almost think, why in the world does he even bring in verse 10? What was the point in bringing in verse 10, Paul? We, we got the point. And now you bring in verse 10? And Paul writes by the Holy Ghost, and he says, And not only this, but that was also Rebecca also. When she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. What's his point? Class? Huh? Two types. Two types. Flesh and spirit. One flesh, one spirit. One father. One father. Two natures. Esau had the same father as Jacob. The children of the prosperity message all call God their father. That's what the prophet said continually. Have you not just said to me, My God, we of Israel know thee? And they continue in their lust, just like Esau. And they don't know. I mean, they're ignorant. They don't know. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, he said. God is saying something to us. Everything that says I'm born again falls into two categories. One's born of a what? Flesh. And one's born of a what? Spirit. And they both profess to be born again. That's what no one understood before. That's why it said, though Abraham's seed be as a sand of a seashore. Let me tell you about those grains of sand. Pick up a handful, you've got two kinds of natures there. Mm -hmm. And then he said, only the remnant shall be saved. Who are the remnant? Those who are the spirit, those who are children of God's promises, those who walk by faith. And what is God saying to us? There's only a small amount that will be willing to allow themselves to be controlled by the spirit and not be controlled by their flesh and its appetites. Therefore, Paul writes in Philippians 3, he said, I've told you before and tell you again even weeping. He said they walk as enemies of the cross whose God is their appetite, they glory in their shame. Well, you know, remember King James says their belly is their God. We represent much better their appetites, their lustful desires. They're happy with their father as long as he fulfills their lustful desires. That is what's happened today since he came. That's right. That's exactly right, Brother Amos. One wants it easy, and the other one said, I'm going to press on no matter what I have to press through. And that's what prosperity means. The word prosperity in its root meaning means, and let me tell you about root words so you understand what I'm saying to you. The Hebrew language and the Greek language begins with a major word. And every word that's kin to it reflects back to its original meaning. And the word prosperity means to press through to righteousness. That's why he said, if you meditate on my word day and night, you'll have success wherever you go. What's the success? To always be able to press through to righteousness. Every decision you make, why? Because you meditate on the word of God continuously, will be pressing through to righteousness. For example, uh, one one of the flesh, we came here yesterday and see me calling the police, we're not letting me back out of here. They would have said, what is he doing? I came up here, she spread her ego on the floor. I said, well, what do I do? I said, I know you gave me a word to give him tonight. A revelation to give him tonight, they never heard. And I heard inside, real quick, the law is for the lawless. I didn't have to even ask, wonder about it. 
What decision to make? You follow what I'm saying to you? I meditate on the word. I'm not boasting in myself, boasting in Jesus. Because one time I was meditating on money and bucks and Rolls Royces and big houses and Cadillacs and airplanes and helicopters. You should have seen the house I designed. I said, if I got two stories, I'm going to have a three-story one. See? That's what Paul was talking about. He said, they're enemies of the cross. I tell you, even weeping, they set their minds on earthly things. Paul says again in Colossians 3, if you have been raised up with Christ, seek those things above where Christ is seated. Is that right? Yes. Set not your mind on things of the earth, but on things above. Is that right? Two kinds of sand. All have one father. Though Abraham's seed be as a seashore, there's only a remnant that shall be saved. Isaiah says very clearly in the sixth chapter, 10%. Amos 5, the first three verses says, it's going to only be 10%. Zechariah says one third. And they all say the same thing. Only a few. Jesus said the same thing in Matthew 7, didn't he? Broad is the way that leads to destruction. The broad way is the way of those that's born of the flesh. Don't have a human being to it, the world. But there's a narrow way, he said, and few that be that find it. All God's been saying is remnant, 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 remnant. All claiming to have one father. Is this making sense to you now? Amen. Let's continue. He says, for though the twins were not yet born, and had not done anything good or bad. Does your Bible say they weren't even born yet? Yes. But I want you to watch how God reacts. You know, before I was born, God knew me. Before you were born, God knew you. They had not done anything good or bad in order that God's purpose according to his choice might stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls, it was said to her, the older will serve the younger. Is that in your Bible? Yes. The older will serve the younger. And the reason I want to show you what God is saying to us is because we live in a time where abortion is taking place left and right. And, and I remember for a while I wasn't even involved in it, didn't even care about it. In fact, people come and said, they couldn't about abortion. I said, I don't want to hear about that stuff. Because I just did not understand the horrors of it. And it was really brought home when I knew I was born in six months. And Fernando came with this picture of this baby with his head chopped off and his arm ripped out of his arm. At seven months. I said, this child had a better chance to live than I did. I weighed a pound three ounces. Is that right, mother? So I knew. See? And I said, here's a seven-month-old child. And no one cares. The Lord says continually, who will speak for the helpless? Say. Now that's what happens. So God told this mother what the outcome of these two boys were going to be. God knew. It was said to her, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. Well, let me show you why God is able to say that. Do you know before you were born, God spoke over you before you were ever conceived whether he loved you or hated you. See, folks, we don't know God. Let me just give you this encouraging, encouraging news. You know, all of us running back to his grace with all the mess-ups and the mix-ups and the he kept saying, I still love them. They just don't know any better. I think of the times before I was saved, I could have been killed. But he protected me. Most of us can go back and remember times that we didn't even know God. He protected us. Because he saw us before we were born. I used to wonder why there were friends of mine in high school. They got killed maybe in accidents and tragedies. Because God already knew they would never come to him. Not one sheep will be lost. Not one. Not one. Not one. See, I was going and complaining to God one day. And I said, God, 
Look at all these people that's trapped in the, the prosperity message. And I mean, I was grieving. And the Lord said to me, not one sheep will be lost. And I said, oh. When we were grieving at the abortion chambers and Elizabeth was crying, and I said, oh God, that poor lady's heart is so broken. I heard the Lord say to me, he said, what you're doing is victory, whether you pull them out or don't pull them out. But that was a strange thing to hear, wasn't it? And I said, victory? He said, yes, you see, every child that's aborted comes to me immediately. And I said, that's right. But let's be found through our part. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Let me just take this scripture to show that God knew us. Go to Genesis 18. Where it says in the 19th verse. theme of the of ninth chapter. God knew us before the foundation of the world. God says in Genesis 18 verse 19 I have chosen him in order that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord. That's why when I see these preachers with bad children it just grieves my soul. I know what it says in uh, the Word of God, all through Timothy, and when Paul wrote to him, and uh, when Peter wrote about those that, and, and all through Titus, about the qualification of a minister, about his children. And, I mean, we, we went through things when, as Pentecostals, and we call ourselves that, and um, what we would say, I mean, the children are the worst things in the church. The Bible says a man can't control his children. How can he rule the house of God? So God chose this man. And he said, I've chosen him that he may command, not just say, Johnny, don't do that, command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord. You command them to keep the way of the Lord. By doing righteousness and justice in order, in order, in order. If this is not done, then the promise of God to us is void. But in order, the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. Are those words in your Bible? Let's go to Jeremiah 1 because I want you to see that how God knew us. Jeremiah, the first chapter. Jeremiah 1. I think there's something I'm going to show you in John 10. Make sure I got the right marker. Look what it says in the fifth verse. Jeremiah 1. first word you see in verse 5? Before. 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 Before I formed you in the womb I knew you. And before you were born I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. Before. There were two befores there. Did you see them? Before. That's why the Lord was able to say what he said in John 10. And the 14th verse.
He says, I'm the good shepherd, and I what? Know my own. And my own know me. He knows us. He always knew us. Before Jesus ever came to this world, before it was even formed and created, God knew every one of us that would be found standing with a lamb on Mount Zion that is symbolically talked about in Revelation as 144,000, that is symbolically talked about in Isaiah 4 as the seven women. He knew us. He knew us. He knew the ones of us that would obey him. In verse 25, Jesus is talking to some religious people. And these religious people are Jews who were Israelites, to whom belonged the adoption as sons, to whom had the ordinances and the covenants, to whom was given the law and the prophets, and through whom came the Christ. Guess what? I want you to see what he said to them. This is Jesus himself talking to these people. Look what he says in verse 25. In verse 24, I want to show you the Jews. The Jews therefore gathered around him and were saying to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you're the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you you don't believe the works that I do in my Father's name, these bear witness of me, but you do not believe because you're not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Is that in your Bible? You remember? Well, I'll, I'll continue. And I give eternal life to them, and they shall never perish. And no one shall snatch them out of my hand. Now, uh, Jesus saw us way off, a long ways off. That's what the prodigal son parable is all about. When that son said, I'm going to arise, go back to my father's house. When we were sitting in our churches of delusions, something started taking place in our heart and uneasiness, a stirring, we started saying things like, I just can't buy this. This can't be right. I don't agree with this. And the scripture in your mind would come up and say, the scriptures say this. How, how can I reconcile this? And it kept happening, an uneasiness. So it turned from an uneasiness to an agony. Then it went from an agony to a torment. To a finally just torment out of the place. But the moment you said, I want the truth, the Father saw you way off. And he got into a trot. The Bible says his Father ran to him and embraced him. To put the authority back on him, put the rule back on him. He knew us. That's what it means. He knew us. He died for the sins of the whole world. He died for every man to be saved. It's like a father and a mother having discernment, knowing her children, saying, I have made quite a spread on this table, but the wrath don't like string beams, but the string beams are made for wrath for his good. Joanne hides the little pie because if she sees it, that's all she'll run to. Because a parent knows the children. After a while, they know the ones that will be rebellious and the ones that will be obedient. They know. Amen. One father, two natures, one of the flesh, one of the spirit. One father given birth to so many. Though the sea be as a sound of seashore, it's only the remnant shall be saved. Amen? Amen. In 2 Timothy 2, look there with me, please. The 
has an amazing verse, the 19th verse. Amazing. Now, well, let me just do this, do it in short, okay? This verse, 19, is written by Paul. Let us know that the word of God has not failed. The same thing we read while the word of Romans died. Okay? And what he said, he said, the word of God has not failed. They're not all Israel or descended from Israel. Remember him saying that? Now, he's writing from the same perspective. And so, let's just get up to like verse 15. He says, be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, handling accurately the word of truth, but avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Herminius and Philetus. Men who have gone astray from the truth, saying, the resurrection has already taken place, and thus they upset the faith of some. And Paul was saying, no matter what lies come down the pipe, no matter what false doctrine is being preached, no matter how many delusions are flitting around us everywhere, he, then he writes verse 19. He says, Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands, which means it can't be overthrown. By the way, what's the firm foundation? Jesus, Jesus Christ. What else? The apostles of old, of the New Testament, and the prophets of the Old Testament. One foundation have been built on the foundation of the prophets and the apostles and Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. He said, it stands. Having this seal, and he talks about this seal when it's in our hearts. How do you know when the seal's in your heart? Hmm? That's a good answer. Well, that's real good. Mr. K. Huh? Love of God controls us. That's a real good answer, too. All three answers are just real good. You'll know you're going to shut up a doubt when you hear the Word of God inside you talking continuously. Look closely what it says there. Those are quotation marks. Before the Word, the Lord knows those who are His. Do you see them? Those are quotation marks. Something is talking inside of you. Sister Linda, is that your name? She gave an answer. She said, it bears witness. God is continually speaking to us. Continually within us. We're hearing instructions. Don't do that. One of the prophets, I think, is it, is it, is it uh, Isaiah, is it Jeremiah, said that whenever you go to the right or to the left, you hear a voice behind you saying, is it Isaiah? Saying, no, no, this is the way walk you there in it. That's that seal. If you're not one of those who spend time in the Word, you start hearing one of those songs that you sang in church singing inside of you, one that you liked and enjoyed. See, God will work with what you've been exposed to. And so this seal begins to say something. The Lord knows those who are His. Did you catch that? The Lord knows those who are His. It's like a father knows their children. See, the children are the ones, according to their will, choose whether to obey their parents or rebel against their parents. Is that right? Some children are obedient because they don't like boards on the little backsides. Amen? After a while, they begin to catch on. You know, it's, it's not so bad to be nice. <laughs> the other one says, I don't care what they say. Yeah. I'm going to do what I want to do. And you can beat their brains out. And they'll still rebel. That's what it means. God's the Father. He sees all the sea. And he already knows the ones that are going to rebel. Let everyone who names the name of the Lord abstain from wickedness. You remember the sand of the seashore? Two kinds of sea. 
That's what verse 20 is about. Now in a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels. What is the house here? Okay. What, I, I thought I heard somebody whisper. What'd you say? The heart. The heart. That's an interesting answer. Let me ask you this question. Remember the parable? If I tell you the parable, you should get it. He told us a parable when he walked the earth about the angels of God and a fishing net. It was thrown out into the sea and the net was brought in in the last days and the angels sat down and began to put the good fish in containers and the worthless ones they did what? They threw away. So shall it be, he said, at the end of the age. The gospel is a net. It brings in the seed, two kinds of seed, doesn't it? And the angels of God are the builders, aren't they? Hmm? No, the kingdom is the house. In God's kingdom, it's kingdom. He talked also about a time coming when he would remove out the what? The wicked from among the righteous. And then the sons of the kingdom of what? Shine forth. That's what's beginning to happen now. That's right. The separation is taking place. Are y'all following me? Don't you love the book of Romans now? <laughs> what he says. In a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and earthenware, which means in my kingdom, they all claim to be my sons. They're silver and gold, and they can take the pressure and the test, and it's purified through fire. But there are those who are vessels of wood, which means they will burn. Earthenware, which means they'll be ruthlessly shattered. Some to honor, some of this honor. Daniel talked about it. Remember? About some awake to honor, and some awake up to what? Dishonor. And it's all saying the same thing. Though Abraham's seed be as the sand of the seashore, there's only a remnant that shall be saved. Is this making sense now? Okay. Let's go one more place, please. Let's go to Psalms, the first chapter. Psalms 1. And let's look at the sixth verse. The Lord knows his children, doesn't he, folks? Those that will willfully obey. Whosoever will may come. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Amen? Hosea 14. Look at the ninth verse with me. Hosea 14, verse 9. Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them, for the ways of the Lord are right, and the righteous will, that means of his own will. Nope. You, you guess that? The righteous will walk in them. The righteous will walk in them. The Lord knows those that are his. The Lord knows the way of the righteous. The righteous will walk in his ways. How many of you parents have children, and you don't want to, probably want to admit it, but there are some children that give you more joy than the others do? You might almost go out and say that there's some that you sort of favor more than the others. Jesus did that, didn't he, among his disciples. Peter, James, and John was always with him on those little intimate things, weren't they? I've often asked myself, what was the other man thinking about? I 
I remember a woman that was complaining to the Lord. I heard this was told to me. She said, you always say no respect to a person. She said, but I think that you all respect to a person. You let John lie on your bosom. You let the rest lie on your bosom. Jesus asked her and said to her, they could have all lied on my bosom, but only John wanted to. He did. And I did not prevent him. He said, just like I did not prevent the others either. <laughs> but the transgressors, the Bible says, will stumble in them. The righteous will always walk in them. Is that right? In 1 Corinthians, the 8th chapter, look what it says about those that really love him, if you love me. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 3. I'm going to tell people in the next session when we begin in maybe late August or September, that month they'll just exercise their fingers really well because when Bible school starts, we sort of just run through the pages, you know. If anyone loves God, What does your Bible say? He's known by him. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the earth, searching for those whose hearts are completely his. Right now, the eyes of God are searching this room, searching the world. And the second the moment that you said, Lord, I'm going right back to the word. The Holy Spirit says, here's one. And immediately the angels of God were assigned. The temple's being built with living stones, not brick and mortar. Human lives. The angels of the builders. <laughs> in Galatians 4th chapter the Lord writes again by his spirit to us through brother Paul verse 8 and 9 however at that time when you did not know God you were slaves to those which by nature are, are not God's but now that you come to know God, or rather be known by God, God knows those that love him. Is that right? Let me ask you a question. Can you still remember when you first got saved? Did you love him? Were you excited? Yeah. No one had to tell you to witness if they. You couldn't help it. You even took chances on friends that you knew might be offended, didn't you? And you said, I have a taste of my love of God. The love went out, didn't it? Friends came and, and they said things to you like, Well, let's go out and let's go out and party tonight. And you thought, I love him, but I can't do it. What if I should say anything? They might not like me. And so the little battle went on just a little while. And you said, I, I can't help it, I love God. And you said, Well, I, I, I used to do that, but I don't do that no more. Uh, I became a Christian. You what? I became a Christian. You mean your God won't you have fun? Well, uh, it's not right for a Christian to do those things. Well, what's wrong with it? Didn't Jesus turn the water into wine? And you stood your ground there, didn't you? You were tested by them, weren't you? They came back around again, didn't they? And then they finally said to you one day, you're not fun to be around no more. And they left you, didn't they? Yeah, you felt a little sorrow, but you didn't give up your lover, did you? And so that's what Paul is saying to them. He says, you came to a place to be known by God. How is it that you turn back again to the weak and the worthless elemental things to which you desire to be enslaved, he says, all over again. God knows us. He always knew us. Amen? To show you how well he knew us, 
I, I guess one of my favorite uh, stories in the Bible is John 1, a very short story. John chapter 1. I, I don't know why, this story just turns me on. I, I get a charge out of it when I read it. I'll probably get another one today. I know I will. But I like this guy because uh, Nathaniel was one of those guys that thought he really had together. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, Philip said to him, we found him, we found him. And they had all been waiting for him to make his appearance in the world, of course. And Nathaniel, he was like a skeptic. You know, he, he was like, he had a hard heart, you might say, in a sense. He, he wasn't influenced very easily. But something happened here. I like it. Let's read at verse 45. Philip found Nathaniel and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathaniel said to him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? We went to Nazareth, folks. We discovered in Israel it was a place of robbers and thieves and swindlers. You might say that Nazareth, to put it in, in the way we would speak today, is, was like a, a, a red light district almost. And so Nathaniel says, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Just come and see. But notice that. Come. Nathaniel had to come of his own free will, didn't he? Come and see. Jesus saw Nathaniel coming to him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. In other words, we, we learn something about Nathaniel's heart. No guile. He had a type of purity in his heart. But he wanted the reality of it. He didn't want to be deceived. That's why he wanted to come. But here's the part that I like is verse 48. Nathaniel said to him, How do you know me? I like that. <laughs> this is the answer. Jesus answered, said to him, Before Philip called you. When you were under the fig tree. <laughs> Can you believe that? <laughs> I saw you. I thought about it. I said, I can just see God saying, when you was in the business world, I saw you. When you was in the prosperity message, I saw you. I kept calling you. I knew you. <laughs> Don't you like that? Notice how pure this man's heart was. I mean, it didn't take much convincing, did it? And I want you to hear something. Nathaniel had the revelation of it before Peter did. Look what Nathaniel answered and said to him. Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You shall see great things in these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you shall see the heavens open. And the angels of God descending and ascending on the Son of Man. If you're joined to Jesus or join in with him, the angels of God are supposed to be ascending and descending upon you. And the devastators and the destroyers, he said, would depart from the life and the bills would hurry. That's what he said. Yeah. That's what we're all passing through right now. There has never been the activity of angels around us as it is today. And the angels, let me help you, were not errand boys to bring you dollar bills and blessings and things. Their job is to engrave you with the gold and the silver that comes from above the character of the Lamb. That's the purpose of angels. To protect you, to deliver you, to make sure your steps are being guided correctly, as I said to you yesterday. If you can, get the tape. Um, 
Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan is done like for kids, but it will really speak to you. Of course, in the tape, they don't show you the things that angels do to us. But in John Bunyan's book, the time they got trapped in this false message, Satan killed himself. He's wearing a black hood in a little video. And uh, he tricked them. And when they bought the lie of the, of the angel of light, Satan says, the servants come as angels of light, they were put into a net. So on the little video, they don't show this. But in the book, that angel took a stick and he must have beat them to a bloody pulp for doing that. And that's what happens. So they beat our brains after we come back to God. Isn't it wonderful? I'll get laughing. Go to John 6. Verse 70 and 71. Oh Lord, I can't believe this. Jesus answered them, Shall well he knows all things. Did I not myself choose you for twelve? He knew. Yet one of you is a devil. Now he meant Judas the son of Simon his character, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. I had a question for you. Did Jesus make Judas his character betray him? Did Jesus influence Judas its character to betray him? No. But he didn't stop him, did he? All the Lord is saying to us through Paul's writings, because we're about to go into this territory of predestination, is that God freely gave all men the opportunity to be saved. That was why Paul could write Titus 2. That salvation has appeared to all men. The grace of God appeared bringing salvation to all men. An opportunity to them Jews. That's all he was saying. And God was simply saying, I won't do anything to influence you. You choose. There's a walk of death before you. There's a walk of life before you. You choose. I will give you this hint. Choose life. I will tell you that much. Choose life. But you choose. Okay. In Luke 19. I'm sure how well Jesus knew us. Ah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. It's fun. I don't understand this. While they go ahead and click off in advance, well, we'll stop in, uh, it's uh, 12.35. We'll be getting in at 12.45. Uh, we'll give you time.